Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to the sixth meeting of the Community Advisory Task Force for the Climate Action Plan. My name is Sarah Allison. I'm a sustainability analyst here with Clackamas County. Um, I'm going to get us started today with a land acknowledgement and then I'll pass things off to Monica uh, for the focus of our meeting. We have the next slide. Um, so this land acknowledgement was actually adopted this month by Clackamas County. Um, it's our first official land acknowledgement. Um, and it was developed in collaboration with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde with our um, Equity and Inclusion Office. So I am very excited to be able to share it today. What we now call Clackamas County is the traditional lands and waterways of the Clackamas, Chinook Bands, Kalapuya, Kathlamet, Malala, Multnomah, Tualatin, Tumwater, Wasco, and many other tribes of the Willamette Valley and Western Oregon. We will never be able to name every tribe that visited or lived upon this land because these communities frequently traveled for trade and other reasons. The indigenous people lived, traded, and navigated along great rivers and tributaries presently named the Clackamas, Malala, Pudding, Sandy, and Willamette. Many of the original inhabitants of this land died from disease, war, and other conflicts. Those that survived these tragedies were forcibly removed and relocated by European settlers and the United States government because of the land's value. Today, their descendants live on, still carrying on the traditions and cultures of their ancestors. We honor the Native American people of Clackamas County as a vibrant, foundational, and integral part of our community here today. We respectfully acknowledge Wayist, also known as Mount Hood, and Yayas Tai. Tumwater, also known as Willamette Falls, as sacred sites for many Native Americans. We thank those who have connection to this land and serve as stewards working to ensure our ecosystem stays balanced and healthy. Acknowledging the original people of the land is a simple, powerful practice that demonstrates respect by making indigenous people's history and culture visible. It is also a small step along the path towards reconciliation and repair. Please join us in taking this opportunity to thank and honor the original caretakers of this land. Thank you. And with that, I will pass things off to Monica for more about today's meeting. Thanks, Sarah. That's a really beautiful addition. All right. So what are we here to do today? We're here to prepare for our community engagement. So this is um, the period when this first round of the CATF meetings comes to a close around mid to end November. And when we bring all of the great work that you plus the consultants and the project management team have created as drafts out to the public to have conversations. And then we're also here to talk about the Youth Advisory Task Force as a group that has been meeting since you know, even before the CATF convened and has been engaging with the um, the data and with the science and with the materials and have some feedback to offer and will continue to be involved in our discussions and processes. So um, we're going to have some time to hear from Cassie, who is our YATF liaison and CATF member. Do you want to raise your hand, Cassie? I'm sure everyone knows you, but just yes, you'll hear from her in a moment. And we're going to review the community engagement approach. And I want to hear suggestions for improvement from you all. And a quick plug that I did add a table on base camp this morning. It's kind of a um, like crib notes for what we'll go through today. So I would encourage you to pull that up um, when we get to that point in the conversation. Then we're also going to be talking about some key audiences for our engagement activities. So we've done some brainstorming and asking and thinking about who uh, we should talk to depending on which engagement type. And we want to hear from you all, given the relationships that you have. And then we'll talk about some shared values and how we can at least start our conversations from a place of common ground with the public. And again, want to hear from you all about ways that we can improve what we've crafted so far. So next slide. Uh, this, this reflects really what I just shared, just uh, the flow of the conversation today. We've got just about two hours um, uh, from here moving forward. 
will um, about equal time moving through each of those pieces. We're going to stay as a large group for the first um, hour and 20 minutes. And then towards this, the second third of the meeting, we'll have a couple small groups where you guys are giving us more direct feedback about the audiences and the values and perspectives. Um, the only thing I would change about this agenda is that we're flip flopping the order. So we're going to talk about audiences first and then values. Next slide. Quick orientation to for where we are and where we're headed next. So today we're reviewing the engagement approach and I appreciate all of your flexibility as we stepped back and needed to take some additional time to for the um, the data modeling folks SSG to craft the low carbon scenario, um, the proposed low carbon scenario based on a lot of the ideas that you guys have provided over the past couple months and are still engaging with the project management team to um, contextualize it within Clackamas County. So our next step in our conversation is to review the low carbon scenario and then continue where we left off essentially with that strategy alignment and brainstorming and then ending with a prioritizing those strategies and closing out on phase one as prep to have these conversations with the public. So next slide. Katie. So we will um, open public comment. <clears throat> if there's any members of the public who would like to share at this time, we ask that you uh, raise your hand to let us know. I also want to remind the task force members that um, any comment that we get from the community in writing um, outside of the meeting, we are posting in Basecamp, and we encourage you to take a look at those comments and um, consider those as you continue to participate on the task force and provide input. Um, so with that, we will open it up to public comment if there's anyone who has um, anything they'd like to say. And I'm not seeing any raised hands. So, and I don't see anything in chat, so we will move on. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. And I think there, there are some comments up there right now, right, from the public that folks can review. Yes. Okay, so moving on. Is that, is this the next activity, Monica? It sure is. Okay. Okay, so you should have received some um, links from Sarah and I think that Sarah and Nina came in after you sent out the link, so she may need them as well. We're going to try out a tool. This is a virtual engagement tool that we would like to do with the public as well. So we want to give you a little flavor of what it looks and feels like uh, as we begin this conversation around engaging with the public. So if you click on the, the link uh, to Slido, which is the, uh, the link sent at 101 from Sarah, the app.slido. And you should uh, once you arrive there, there are a prompt should appear on your screen. And if not, along the top, there's a Q&A with a little word bubble and then next to it is a polls. Click on the polls and there should be a prompt there for you. So considering your personal why for participating on the CATF, I want you to share one or two values that describe your motivations. So this is in lieu of us going around the room and sharing our names and organizations and responding to this question. But again, it's gonna give us this flavor of what's, the, what's happening uh, within the room together and a flavor for how we might engage with folks virtually in the future. So feel free to, we'll take just like two or so minutes and uh, respond to that question. Just for clarity, what, what would you say or, or give us an example of values? What kind of values are you talking about? 
Oh, when I asked myself this question, I thought, um, um, like, I thought about justice, I thought about transformation, I thought about um, sustainability, I thought about collaboration, uh, if I was thinking about why I wanted to join a, a, a group, um, community, things along those lines. Does everyone have access in finding their way to this tool? Raise your hand if anybody needs help. Looking for a couple more. We've got 13 votes so far, 13 submissions. There appears to be a character limitation. So you can't write a sentence. Well, you can't even write a three-word phrase. Yeah, three words. If you, if you use big words. I see. I see a couple of uh, few word phrases, but it does encourage you to to be brief. And thank you for that. Okay, I want to show you guys. I can keep adding. So I'm going to share my screen. And here's what we're seeing. So in a, <clears throat> in a public meeting, we would get uh, a range of responses, just like what happened here. And you can see why, William, we're looking for um, one word, two words, short, very short phrases. So we start to, that encourages agreement amongst participants. So community, equity, justice were the most common responses. Monica, we are not seeing your screen. Not there. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. How about now? Okay. Awesome. Yes. So, like I was saying, we've got um, responses that were most common, community, equity, and justice. We see those as bigger words um, and additional responses that, are, um, that maybe only were mentioned once. What we'd like to see happen in our events is that we actually are building from one event to the next as people are responding to questions like these, like values and perspectives and perceptions so that we can show that there's uh, growing agreement across community members within Clackamas County. So again, little flavor, thanks for sharing. And why don't we hop over to Cassie's presentation with the advisory task force. Yeah, so we wanna welcome Cassie Wilson to speak about her work on the youth advisory task force. It has been a pleasure to get to know Cassie and, um, and to see her grow as a leader on the youth advisory task force and then join this group. Um, and so I don't wanna to speak too much because I know she wants to tell her own story um, so I will just go ahead and hand it over to Cassie. Thank you so much, Cassie. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I first wanted to just start by sharing more about why I am engaged in this work and why I joined the YITF, which is probably what I'm going to refer to it as this whole time. So just know that's Youth Advisory Task Force. Um, so I've always cared about climate change. It's always been something on my mind. Um, as a young person growing up, just knowing that it was a thing we were going to have to deal with. Um, but for most of my life, I really thought that mm, if we see the impacts of it, it'll be like towards the end of my life and we've got time and it's fine. And um, the September wildfires last year really changed that for me uh, when the entire county was under some level of evacuation order. That was really my wake up call that uh, the impacts of climate change were already here. And that's what really shifted my um, perspective and made me uh, engage in climate justice work as my number one priority um, in everything I do. And uh, actually, as a result of the wildfires last year, that's what led to me subscribing to the county's YouTube channel, which um, like for watching like the press conferences. And then that's how in December, I discovered the a presentation about the climate action plan. And I had about a million questions and concerns that I emailed in and Sarah kindly answered. And she also suggested at that point that I get more involved and apply for the task force. And so I did, um, and especially, so the youth, the youth advisory task force, I think the threshold was like 25 and under. So I'm 23, I'm the oldest member of the task force. Um, but yeah, so despite our differences though in like, how we all ended up applying for the YTF or differences in background or geographic location. Um, I've noticed there's a lot of common themes um, in the shared story of the YTF. Um, the biggest one being like our concern for our present and futures. It's really hard to plan what you're going to do with your life if you don't know what the world's going to look like. Um, and also just the fact that we're all so young and have lived through so many extreme weather events, even just in the past year um, that were worsened by climate change. And um, we've gotten to share a bit about like those shared connections um, through a personal narrative activity, which maybe this would be a good time to start screen sharing. Should I screen share or? You should have the ability to screen share, yeah. Okay. And then you can point us to where you want us to be. Um, let's see. Manage all my windows here. Um, uh, I'm going to just add, Cassie, while you're looking, that one of the other things that you can use Slido for is there's a Q&A function. Mm -hmm. So next to the polls. So if you're listening to Cassie's uh, sharing of the work of the YTF and a question does pop up, feel free to add questions and thoughts there. Yes, yes, please. Any questions? And if I don't know the answer today, I'm happy to also take stuff back to the YTF. Um, I think maybe Sarah or Monica or Katie or anyone, I think it might be easier if one of you screen shares the mural. Um, Can you uh, direct message me that link? I don't have it up and then I'll yes. be happy to share. But yeah, so one of the things that um, we've been working on is um, learning how to share our stories because um, a lot of the people on the YTF obviously aren't of voting age yet, but learning how to tell and share our stories can allow young people to be civically engaged and advocate for the world we want to see. Um, and so in this mural, you'll get to see, um, and I don't know if we want to share that now or later, but um, you'll get to read through some of the stories from the members of the YTF, um, which are down in that bottom right portion um, that we've been working on and just get to know that group of people more. Um, 
And then Sarah, if you want to zoom in on the demographics, the who we are part. So this is kind of a snapshot of who's on the YGF and, oh, is there an echo happening? I'm not hearing it on my end. Hopefully you can hear me okay, Lisa. Um, but yeah, so again, 25 and under, oh, I guess I am hearing it a little bit. Hey, Lisa, that might be related to your double who's in the waiting room. So if you put one of your um, mics on mute, it should reduce the echo back from what Kate, uh, from Cassie's presentation. Now try talking, Cassie. Let's see if it works. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, so again, uh, the group's 25 and under. I'm the oldest at 23. And you can see that um, we're from different parts of the county, uh, different schools, different ages. Um, I don't remember if this is completely up to date because we have been meeting since March. So there's been some birthdays and graduations and things like that. But this just kind of gives you an idea of who makes up the YTF. And then above that, there is an overview of what we've been working on over the past uh, several months. So one of my favorite things about the YTF is that it's a really perfect opportunity to both learn a bunch of stuff and also be able to give input and apply what we're learning. Um, and so from the beginning, whether it was learning about, um, you know, the differences between equity and fairness and anti-racism and uh, diving more into climate science and climate justice and all of these things that we especially learned a ton about um, in some of our first meetings, then being able to really apply that to everything else we've been talking about um, over the past several months. And so, um, so we learned some of those and then, yeah, we spent time learning more about just, yeah, how we can engage as young people, um, because obviously voting isn't the only way to be engaged. And uh, we spent time envisioning what the future could look like um, if we do take the climate action we need and what our communities can look like. And, um, and then we learned more about specific areas of climate action. So like buildings and energy, transportation, um, and then uh, something that I'll talk a bit more about in a, in a minute here is uh, we spent a bunch of time uh, creating, going through a consensus process to see what climate actions were most important to young people to prioritize. And then um, at our meeting last night, we learned a bunch about how human health and climate change intersect. And we also talked more about resiliency and that part of climate action. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I also haven't been keeping an eye on the Slido, if anyone's. Just a, just a quick question. How were the uh, students uh, selected for this? Uh, how, you know, did you go uh, all school districts, all you know, uh, countywide, or how how did you arrive at these folks? So I can actually share a, a little bit about that. Cassie wasn't involved in the uh, selection process um, for the members. Um, so we put out um, a call to apply. We used our network of schools that we work with across the entire county, as well as some other youth groups, and we ended up having. Uh, 24 youth members apply. Um, so we actually accepted all of the youth um, who applied to maximize the voices that we had. Uh, Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so I want to go more in depth on that consensus activity that we did. So um, if you want to go, I think down to the bottom left. So first I'll just kind of explain how the activity worked. So we started out just each of us individually picking two areas of action that were important to us. 
and then sharing more about why, like what those actions would mean to us and, um, and like, yeah, what would happen if we don't take those actions and then just any other thoughts that we had. And so we each started out with two and then we partnered up with somebody else and from that pair, so then we would have a total of four actions at that point, we had to narrow it down to two. And then from there, those pairs joined up with another pair. And so at that point we had still another four actions, but um, what was it? Like, <laughs> I lose track of the math of how many people are in the room very quickly, but basically we each started out with two actions on our own. And then uh, by the third round of consolidating, we ended up with two actions from small groups. And so um, just to like narrow down like what makes the cut each time. And, um, and there's also a letter that was shared with you all um, before the meeting. Um, but the biggest takeaway is that um, the YITF really prioritized transportation related actions. Um, so whether that was better walking and biking options or more public transit. Um, and some of the reasonings behind that, which I feel like are like some of the most important stuff that came out of this was like hearing more about why it was important, um, was that it would be a lot easier to navigate the community as young people. Um, I think remembering that like a lot of the people on the YTF like can't necessarily drive yet, um, but still need to get places. Um, and like just, it would be a more enjoyable commute. There would be health benefits um, to having other ways to get around. Um, and in that letter too, are some like direct quotes from like our, our mural board that we worked on. Um, and so some of them were like the transportation related actions with um, like increasing access to public transit would have the largest impact on the most people was one of the reasons. Um, somebody else said, I love walking and biking and I feel like I'd go crazy if I didn't get outside for part of the day. Um, somebody else said, many streets around my house don't have sidewalks, which discourages kids from walking to school or to friends' houses. So those were some of the reasonings um, behind the walking and biking and uh, increased transit options. And then one of our other really popular um, actions that we came to consensus around was um, about encouraging destinations being closer to where people live. And so while it's more about land use, um, it was still very much related to transportation. And so one of the takeaways from that was that if we don't take this action, then transportation emissions will continue to rise and people will have to continue to spend large amounts of time in the car, um, especially as our population grows. And then some other reasons that that one was important to people is because building community, like being able to build community within our communities instead of having to go other places to access things like arts and culture and healthcare and education and work, um, being able to have those things where we live. Um, but yeah, so I really encourage you all to dig more into this mural board and um, and also the letter and um, just read more about what the YTF is thinking about all of this. And also on the mural board too is the answers to um, our initial application questions. They're, I think, I believe they're anonymized, but um, just to like give you an idea of like what people were thinking like when they applied um, similar to my story. And um, yeah, I just hopefully the, I feel like the YITF is a good reminder that in taking climate action, we're also improving the lived experiences in our communities for generations to come. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments or observations or anything that you want to hear more of from the YITF? A couple, just had a couple of things. Uh, First one is you know, excellent job on this. 
Is the mural, is that something that's available, uh, you know, like in a series of PDFs that we could download and, uh, and have instead of just this big poster? That might be a handy thing to have just to study further. And then the second thing I just wanted to mention, last thing is uh, Cassie said something early on that astounded me that I think is really important. And that is she said something to the effect, and I think it's a quote that we should bring out here, is that it's hard for these kids to plan for the future, given all the things that they've seen in their short lifespans, which to me is, uh, I never even thought about it from that perspective, but that, that is really a, uh, an astounding comment that uh, makes me really concerned about all this. And so anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. Good job, Cassie. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. And yeah, Sorry, I was going to ask. Yeah, what's yeah, what would be the best way to share this mural link or like this information? Would you be okay with sharing the link, and then we there's a you can download it into a PDF, and we can also add that to Basecamp if people want to spend some more time with the hard copy. So the link is in the in the chat now. And then Ray has a couple of questions. And then I see that Edgar has his, um, his hand raised as well. So Ray, do you wanna speak your questions into the room? Sorry, I should get my cursor to the unmute on too many screens here. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my questions is, uh, since transportation options were focused on by the YATF, were the members asked whether they own a car or have access to a car through their parents? Not that specifically. Um, when we were, when we initially were learning more about transportation emissions, um, people were sharing like what ways they typically get around right now. And most people said by car. Um, and then most people like answered the question of like, how would you like to be getting around? Um, or like, what would you like to see more of um, by talking yeah, about um, more bus options and um, being able to bike and walk where they wanna go. Um, but I don't think we have any specific information on how many people specifically have access to a car on the YITF. Cool. Thank you. I guess a follow-up question that maybe asking those members is, um, whether they uh, would need access to a car like for the financial reasons or they choose to live car free. Like for me personally, I could afford a car, but I choose to bike, walk, and take transit because I prefer not to drive. And so there's a big difference between those two options. So I'm curious if that was discussed at all. I mean, in some of the, like in some of people's reasonings, um, and I think it mentions this in a letter too, like, the yeah the financial burden of driving was like a reasoning too behind like yeah wanting more public transit and walking and bike options um but yeah i think too we could um probably follow up on more specifics with folks who are willing to share thank you edgar i think you're next uh, thank you cassie thank you and the 23 other students said provided this information for our um, Community Advisory Task Force. I really enjoyed reading through your, oh, you can't hear me? A little bit quiet, yep. Uh, hear you now. Yeah. Is that better? It is better. Okay. I just moved closer to the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, so Cassie, I really appreciate the work that you and the 23 students have done to prepare this information for the Community Advisory Task Force. I looked at it and was impressed with the process that you used. And uh, in kind of zeroing in on the, uh, you know, the key takeaway, at least as I understand it, uh, about transportation, um, there were three elements that you really emphasized. Um, you emphasized the emissions component of transportation, health, and community. And I know in my own case, uh, when I was working before I retired, I used to commute by bus from Canby all the way to downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. And I found that there were a number of other people that did the same 
And we did form a community mm. in the sense of as we moved, you know, from Canby to Portland and, and then at the end of the work day back to Canby. And it was really uh, very rewarding to develop that community. So I hope you will continue to, to think about that as you uh, form your own plans. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about health and how it's related to um, you know, your discussion and decision. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And yeah, that's a really good point too about um, just even the social benefit of not commuting isolated in cars. Um, uh, yeah, I guess with health, um, I think I would, I think it just like came from the perspective of, you know, young people like to get out and be active. And especially because like uh, students sit in class all day or, and then yeah, like end up sitting in the car all day like, to commute and stuff. There's just a lot of sitting around. And so I think like having that option to, um, to have a more active way to get around, um, like something we've unintentionally ended up talking about kind of quite a bit is like um, mental health and like the benefits of getting outside. Like one of our closing questions last night was like, what's something we're gonna do to take care of ourselves? Because the climate crisis is a pretty heavy topic. Um, and so um, lots of people talked about just getting outside and taking a walk. And um, I think there's a lot of mental health and physical health um, benefits from that. Mm -hmm. Adam. Uh, so, yeah, thank you once again. Uh, it's, it's actually very exciting to have uh, some younger folks around. I'm just now at the point where I'm realizing I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> but um, I, I'm sort of wondering, like, where where is has your group been uh, discussing sort of the more other the other things that we've been focusing so much on like the industry like food production is has there been a lot of discussion on that is there sort of already just a general consensus like that we just need to do it all better um you know how how is how's how are you all coming to the table uh, around everything outside of the transportation side so now that's incredibly important right now yeah so when we um when we were learning about yeah other other parts of other areas of climate action um we would do activities um related to those um that i think the project team was gathering um gathering our thoughts from those activities um and then um there were like i i think so when we chose like which climate actions to prioritize, I feel like because transportation is something that like really directly affects our lives, like that's like why that was one of the things that um, was so popular. Um, it was interesting too. One of the other things that um, that made it through that only one person had picked in the beginning, but made it all the way to the end, um, I believe, was like protection of wetlands or something like that, um, which was really interesting. And so we had a good conversation about like access to nature and green space and um, that part of things. But I don't know if maybe Sarah or somebody else wants to talk about how that other um, information has been captured. Um, I can say that we, we are capturing um, conversations that happen. I, I am not prepared with a summary of those conversations at this point. Um, but um, we will also, the Youth Advisory Task Force will continue on um, for as long as the CATF is in session. So there are more opportunities for them to, to further those conversations and get more into uh, details beyond sort of those higher level areas that we've talked about so far. I, I might add just not as a participant on the YTF, but kind of um, watching it from afar that they, they started the work in April or May, like March. March. Okay. And so they have been um, learning alongside, you know, developing their narratives alongside getting prepared for winnowing or like converging on ideas. So 
the CATF, you guys were kind of thrown into the fire, so to speak, bringing all of your expertise to the table. And we didn't, we haven't spent time in that unpacking of topics and sectors and industries and um, some of those um, things that would contribute to being prepared to make a decision about what is a priority. So they've been, they've been at this for a while. And through that, right, came to this conclusion that transportation felt like the most meaningful and important work from their perspective. Any other questions or should we all, can we all give an, an, a, a virtual applause? <laughs> that was great, Cassie. Yeah, and um, just to reiterate, the work of the YTF will continue. And we're thinking now that um, we're at the place of being ready to share, well, we're almost at the place of being ready to share the work of the CATF with the public, that we want to be real intentional about how we're weaving in the work of the YATF as um, participants and, and also as another feedback or source of feedback. So when we come back, as, a, as the CATF in the spring, we'll have, um, ex, we'll be integrating some of the feedback from the YATF as well. So this is not the last time you'll hear from Cassie, in part because she's part of the CATF, but also because we're gonna keep hearing from the, from the YATF as well. Okay. So let's, uh, we're, we are, a little bit on ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, and let's start to talk about the engagement approach. So I think that starts on uh, slide nine, Katie. And again, if, uh, if it's helpful for you, I would encourage you to have that table uh, you can follow along with. It's helpful to have some detail in front of you while we go through and unpack each of those steps. Um, I also want to mention that we're going to have time at the end for you to offer some feedback. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper on those two topics, right? The audiences and the values. So starting here with the CAP development overview. So uh, you've seen this visual before. We are right in phase two where, where we are developing those draft strategies um, and we're preparing to have conversations with the public in phase three, which is the feedback period. So next slide. In that feedback period, our purpose is really to uh, share those draft strategies and invite opportunities for refinement um to what's there so if we think again about our mountain you guys have been in that space of the top half of the mountain looking up and starting to think about the pathways to get to the summit we're going to share those pathways with the public um, getting insight from other subject matter expertise experts as well as community members just living in clackamas county that are going to be impacted and or could impact and help to shape what ends up in the climate action plan. So next slide. Here are our broad objectives. So each of the methods that we will use for engagement have their own subset of objectives, but objectives for the engagement. We really want to use this as an opportunity to seek common ground. Um, and to start to build some common ground. So again, we're gonna, we're gonna follow up with what are some frames that we want to start those conversations with later in our meeting. Um, but we wanna find where we can agree and build from that place of agreement. Uh, we want to use the engagement as an opportunity to surface hopes and concerns with the CAP project, to share the targets the draft strategies and implementation ideas and to solicit ideas for improvement. That's gonna look really different, again, depending on the type of engagement, 
but this is an objective, an overall objective. And then to build community awareness, ownership in the CAP and general interest in the work, not only for uh, this period of the CAP being developed, but also into the future when the CAP is implemented over the next 30 years. How are we building in community participation and their interest in, par in participating? So next slide. Here are some core strategies that are guiding the work. And um, this is these strategies were are themes that we've heard. So we being myself and other folks within the, uh, the staff that are part of a, a smaller subset of engagement team based on the conversations that we've had with community members over the past year. So either from interviews that we had in our context gathering stage with some folks that are in the room today, as well as um, conversations with business leaders and rural community members. And here are the engagement strategies, the themes of engagement strategies that we've heard is starting with going to where people are already gathering. So we're gonna talk about that from an audience perspective today, but where are those places that are already trusted where we see the groups and the people that we want to engage that are they're already going, the connections are already established and how we can participate and add on to those spaces versus asking people to come to us. We wanna connect with self-interest. So again, this goes back to how are we building from a place of common ground values that can bridge people's individual self-interest or organizational self-interest or community self-interest with the purpose and the pursuits of the climate action plan. We want to leverage peer to peer connections. So we want to build out from that the usual suspects for who's speaking about the cap. So that means um, potentially branching out from the consultant team or the project staff team within the county. Um, and working with folks like those of you on the CATF to help to leverage the relationships that you all have. And so that the, the public hears these opportunities for engagement and as well as the work of the CAP from voices and from messengers that there's already that trust established and relationships established. And then building on that by emphasizing relationships over centralized communication is we're really looking to build a networked approach to sharing information and opportunities. So this is, again, it's similar in the sense that we're trying to build opportunities for um, community to be hearing about um, engagement opportunities through trusted channels. So uh, that could look like uh, sharing um, event announcements and or articles or things along those lines with some of the networks that you are part of and asking for that support with some of our other colleagues. And then finally, fostering self-determination, community voice and leadership. So throughout the process, we're looking to build the presence of community voice in the work so that the CAP really results in what reflects the community's needs and the priorities and considers the hopes and concerns of the community. So you'll see that in our um, engagement methods and, um, and objectives, as well as some um, initial approaches to how we might hold these conversations to gather that information. So next slide. Okay, so let's get down to the details. Um, and I am keeping one side eye on Slido and chat. So if there are questions along the way, feel free to plug them into either of those channels. And then again, uh, at, after walking through each of these activities, we're gonna go back to Slido and think about um, ways that you might like to see things different and or things that you feel really excited about. Okay, so activities and audiences. So essentially the activities, are, I use the term methods interchangeably. So what are the engagement methods that we're using? and how are we planning to use them with community engagement. So we're essentially proposing the following methods, uh, presentations, 
uh, community-wide discussions, technical advisory groups, surveys, interviews, and then continuing like we've talked about already to convene the Youth Advisory Task Force as another feedback body and generative body, and then continued general outreach. So how are we communicating about the work of the CAP um, and um, relevant education and announcements through various channels? So let's unpack each of these. So next slide. So we've got presentations. And if, if you're following along on your table, you see that um, the table is kind of color blocked and uh, the, the colors show the level of um, engagement when we're looking at uh, the engagement spectrum from, gosh, what is it? The IEP, International Public Engagement. AP2, International Association of Public Participation. Thank you, thank you. And at these first two options of presentations and community-wide discussions, it's at the level of informing and consulting. So from a presentation perspective, we want to get on um, as many agendas, we're going to where people are as possible in order to share, to learn about participant experiences with, with a changing climate and perceptions of climate change and climate, act, climate action, to share the science as rationale for why this CAP exists, to build awareness of the CAP process, and to surface and build understanding of hopes and fears related to the CAP. And then as time allows, you know, we may have 15 minutes on agenda where we get to do a quick overview. We may have a longer period. Um, we then we will be able to um, consult on specific topics as time allows and it's appropriate. So if we go to the next slide, here's a, and, I, and I'm seeing someone's comment about self-interest. So I'm gonna come back to that towards the end, okay? William and Ray. So here's a potential flow for what a presentation, what we would cover uh, in the conversation. So knowing that um, there may be a range of perspectives, uh, depending on the audience that we're participating with, we still want to start the conversation from that place of shared value and common ground value, and, and then augment how much, you know, the, the ratio or proportion of what we're sharing and focusing on based on um, anticipated audience needs. So starting with that shared value, uh, we got some great suggestions to off offer prompts that start to elicit experiences from people so that we're hearing about what are, what are their personal experiences with related to a, to a changing climate. Um, some suggestions around, did anyone else have their wells go dry last summer? Who lost trees or plants with the heat waves? Were any businesses impacted by the, by the wildfire? So what you're noticing here is that we're not defining climate change for people, or we're also not trying to convince people that it exists or that it's real. But we want to hear if people have had personal experiences with, with changes uh, and what their perceptions are. And then sharing the connection between their experiences and um, changes to climate. So this is where it starts to build the basis for us to provide an overview of the CAP, why it's important. And then sharing science that's really tied to why the CAP is important now and including data and information that's relevant to the audiences that we're talking to. So that could be anything from this very localized data to Clackamas County and or data that is specific to um, farmers or producers or to um, um, other like some other groups, uh, specific groups. And then providing a brief engagement overview and then offering a call to action and asking for help spreading the word. Okay, so moving on. And again, feel free to pop, I, 
pop questions into the Slido if you have questions about specific methods and then we'll have a chance to unpack it at the end. So very similar purpose with the community-wide discussions. However, these are intended to be longer conversations with the public as well as um, serve as culminating events where we're sharing out um, what has happened with engagement to date. What are some of the themes that we're starting to hear? Um, and what are some of what is some of that emerging consensus that's that is coming out? Uh, it'll also provide time for kind of high level education alongside opportunities to react to and refine some of the draft ideas. So um, I think the, the level and the type were, is a little TBD, depending on what we're hearing from the public at the point, but um, carving out some time to solicit some feedback on topics. And then really the, the additional purpose of these community-wide discussions is to bring in a cross-section of the county to encourage cross-sector listening and understanding and for um, peers, community members, colleagues across industries and sectors to hear from each other and interact with each other on these topics. Next slide. Uh, again, similar to the presentation, but starting with the common ground value that are easy, it's easily shared across what we're now seeing as several participants, personal, professional, lived experience, um, hear from community members. So this is a time where we're thinking we could try out um, potentially one of the strategies that did come up a lot in our conversations about um, hearing from a trusted voice. Uh, hearing from someone from a in, an in-group voice around their experience with changes to a climate. Engage in an activity to build uh, understanding amongst the group, um, sharing themes of what we've been hearing, and share high-level business as planned and low-carbon scenario models. This is to show people here's where we are, and here's where we're going to illustrate what the CAP is trying to achieve. And then time to review draft plan elements, as I mentioned. Okay, Jeff, I see your question. And we're gonna to talk today about determining audiences. Okay, that'll be right after we go through all of these methods. So then now we're going down the table. We've, we've changed into a new color now where we're, um, and I don't have the table right in front of me, uh, where we are now asking for deeper feedback on the content. So with technical advisory groups, as well as um, interviews, we're wanting to transition to more robust level of involvement and consultation. So we're calling technical advisory groups, they, they mimic what you would see in a focus group where we're pulling together people around a similar uh, experience or similar content expertise, field of content expertise in order for them to give us more detailed reactions to the strategies developed by you all and with the YTF and the staff. When we would um, convene around eight to 10 of these uh, across the county and we will have a chance to wait. You all will have a chance to weigh in on what, how do we break up the groups based on content and topics, as well as who are the people that would participate in each of those content areas. So we want that we want these conversations to be about half and half, where we're talking about the modeling categories. I'm sorry, the groups would be broke up, have broken up half and half, where we're, half of them will be based on the modeling categories the same way that you guys have been broken up around buildings, energy, food and egg and natural resources, and then half related to additional topics that we know are really important to gather people around. Okay, next slide. Um, again, going deeper. So we're gonna provide an overview of the CAP process, share that where we are and where we're headed from the businesses plan to the low carbon um, scenario summary, and then based on the um, expertise of the group, we would go deeper on any particular category. So you know how you all have been developing 
target outcomes and high level actions and strategies related to categorical topics. That's what would be shared back with these tags so that they're giving uh, feedback related to the areas that they are most informed about, as well as these other content areas that we'll check in about after the presentation. Okay, I'm going to check in with the chat because I see a handful of questions. Jeff, so you have your question about determining audiences, which we'll get to. It's Sally, do we have a link to this part of the deck? Uh, do you, are you talking about the slide deck? We can share the, I can share the PDF of the, the PowerPoint after, would that be helpful? Okay. But if you follow along on that table, it will give you, and that's on Basecamp. I posted it today, it's in the CATF folder. It will give you a little bit of something to hold on to and track while we're going into more detail on the presentation. Can't see the new Slido link. So Bill, are you looking for the link to Slido? Well, I have the base camp uh, open with the, is that the one we're looking at or the Slido? Cause I don't. Oh, so the, the base camp had a link to a table uh, that I posted today in the CATF folder. And it's kind of like a crib sheet for what I'm covering in the PowerPoint. Right, it shows the audience audiences and then the, the, the tables. That's the correct one, right? Um, it should say type and then objectives, audiences and timeline. And there's various gradations of blue. Uh, I, I guess I don't have that one. But, uh... Okay, so that's on Basecamp. And then the if you, you might be looking at the mural board, Bill. If you're okay. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about next, or what are the audiences that we'll focus on for presentations and for the tags. And um, let's see, how are tags connected to input from the community? Um, Edgar, I'm going to take a stab at your question. And the tags are the community, it is a type of uh, engagement method to get input from the community. Okay, so uh, when we go to those audiences, it might be illustrated better for you, but it's it's one method. These are all methods or the activities that we'll use to gather input across the county. We're casting, we're trying a lot of different methods to um, reach as much of the community as possible. Thank you, Jeff, for putting the table into the chat. And William, deniers have as foundational common values here, assumption that the common value approach will insight us from the anger and fear. No, I don't think is an assumption that a common ground value will insulate us, but we still wanna start from a, try to start from a place of common ground to open the door, open the door to the conversation. So I would call it not an either or, maybe a, a both and, yeah, okay. Any questions, Jeff? I think there was a comment about self-interest that I saw floating through here. Oh, that was you too, William. Have some concerns regarding the effectiveness of self-interest as a strategy. Do you wanna say more about that? Yeah, um, it's theoretically at least, um, everything we're doing is, really juxtaposed against the concept of self-interest as most American consumers think about it. Um, and my sense is it's not as powerful a tool as many people think it is. Mm -hmm. And as evidenced by that, um, people are willing to die rather than get vaxxed. And if self-interest was as powerful as many of us think it is, they wouldn't be killing themselves. Um, so I would rather see, if, if we insist on keeping it as one of the strategies, I'd like it near the bottom rather than second, mm -hmm. uh, assuming there's some priority order in that, maybe there isn't. And you, you did float the concept of community self-interest. Um, and I like the community part, the self-interest part, not so much. And it seems 
it seems as if we're if we focus on an argument based on self-interest and then we're trying to build community, we are pushing and pulling at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying do away with it, but I would I wouldn't run to it early and I would minimize it and speak to larger themes. Um, more universal than the self. That's all. No, that's really interesting. So I'm hearing the tension between um, personal and collective, individual and community, and not wanting to reinforce the individual. And that there could be an opportunity to broaden the statement and the sentiment so that we can try to reinforce the, um, the community or collective aspect of it. it. It always sounds far more eloquent when you reword it. <laughs> I get the benefit. It's like editing versus writing, right? <laughs> um, thank you. That's a great sure. comment. Okay. And I see one more. Yeah, WIFM is an important factor for most folks. Yes, it is. And um, let's keep floating. Let's keep hanging out with this, especially as we start to dive into what are those, what are some of those common ground values that can speak to with them self-interest and community well-being and community interest. And the economic values of the cap and all narrative. So you're talking about the, um, the shared benefit, Edgar? Yeah, I guess you could call it shared benefit, but um, I'm not sure how to characterize it best. But I think in any um, strategy, um, it's helpful to not just link the, uh, the benefits of um, reduced emissions and reduced uh, uh, CO2 and methane and, you know, focusing on all the technical attributes of all that and really hammer the financial benefits of what the Climate Action Plan will generate. Okay. And it could be, you know, there could be pieces of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be the whole thing, but what are the, inc what are the incremental benefits? Mm -hmm. And uh, I found in my previous work with Energy Trust of Oregon that Absent a discussion of financial benefits, it's difficult to motivate a lot of people. You're not alone in that sentiment. Okay. Oh, yes. Thanks, Evan. With them. Okay. So we will keep all of this, this, these comments in view. Um, again, when we when we talk about what some of those common ground values are, they are touching on some of these hopes and concerns about how we are communicating the opportunities. So let's keep unpacking the the methods, and then um, we'll have some time to dive in. So interviews, and I'm gonna. I'm going to cruise through uh, this one a little bit. So um, Katie, next slide. Thank you. Again, this is going to be similar to the TAGs, the technical advisory groups, because we're using these as an opportunity for people who have um, more narrow and or specific expertise on a particular category and or topic that we think is really important in order to shape the, the um, strategies related to the climate action plan. And let me just, I'm not sure if I've said this and I'm, I think I've sensed that it's implied, but really the, the point of this feedback period is to collect all this data to give it back to you, <laughs> the CATF, because then you're gonna get feedback, this uh, synthesized feedback uh, around how did the public react to the draft strategies that we um, that we shared with them that you guys created. So the interviews and the tags are meant to give us real specific feedback where the 
uh, presentations and the community wide discussions are meant around again informing and consulting, but at a at a less deep level than the tags and the interviews. So next slide. Um, very similar content flow. We're sharing the CAP process and objectives for the conversation. We're going deeper on a specific category or topic based on their expertise. Reviewing the low carbon action. So this is this is um, a little sneak preview into what you guys are going to see with the low carbon scenario. But what are those actions that we think need to occur as part of the puzzle to reach carbon neutrality by 2050? engaging with the draft strategies, offering feedback and ideas for improvement, and prompting ideas related to uh, adaptation and resilience, and learning about any context. So the interviews might be a little bit different from TAGS in that respect, that we might be able to go deeper into what is the context that could facilitate or hinder the strategies implementations. So this might be from interviewing folks that um, are regulators within the county or within um, the state that may have perspective on what's happening at the county, um, people who are gonna have more context and content expertise. Okay. And then finally, we've got surveys. Uh, we're thinking two types of surveys. One would be category specific surveys. So if we're if we're drilling down still, this is this will be again at that more granular level where we're sharing what is the what is the low carbon action that we're moving towards. Here are the draft strategies to reach them. People can opt in and opt out to the categories or topics that they are familiar with. They and um, take surveys to their heart's content and give us another, another means to collect people's reactions to the draft strategies. On the other hand, as another means to engage as many people across the county as possible to um, give as many opportunities for people to weigh in and participate at the level that they are ready to participate at, also do community-wide surveys. Um, asking and gathering data regarding the level of awareness, concern, uh, needs around education uh, within each of those categories of action. So we, you know, we learned from the YATF that there's a, a particular level of excitement around one of the categories of action. What does that look like if we ask that across the county? Are there areas that people feel more excited or gravitating towards or feeling like they need more education or have more concerns around. And then a lot of this will also help to inform what type and level of education needs to occur in order to prepare for that the actual implementation. How are, we, how are we aware of what the community needs in order to support the work? Okay, so next slide. Timeline. We are, I feel like we're practically in February now, but we've been talking with rural community members uh, between August and September. Um, and here we are sharing, and we've drafted this approach and testing it with you all. And uh, pretty quickly, we'll be turning around to start to begin engagement planning and outreach to get some dates on the agenda and prepare to schedule and promote those events next in December. And then this will be a real concentrated period of data gathering between January and February, starting with those tags and presentations and moving it and interviews, and then um, continuing with those into February and culminating with the community-wide discussions towards the end of the series. Okay, I'm gonna look back at chat and then um, I want to give you an opportunity to weigh in on how you might like to be involved as CATF members in this period and then get some um, additional feedback on the approach. So I see at least as common, I see self-interest as a person's win. Yeah. That, so Lisa's comment about um, self-interest as a person's win, I think that is 
in line with what we were hearing from the rural key communicators group as well that um, it's the win and it's also developing that that connection for them before even defining what climate change or climate action is so what how do we connect people's experiences and offer them the win and that connection before talking about uh, the bigger picture and Dan's comment that input should be gathered from all citizens uh, without prejudice from our committee. This is how you conduct a sincere and open public process. And that is what we're attempting to do. And uh, through all of these different kind of mixing up the methods and comes down to personal motivation. It's, it's so Jeff, are you saying it's still internally different how if people choose to participate? Uh, I mean, ultimately, it's whether whether you're acting what we would call you know pure selfishness or you know externally for community benefit. Mm. It's still based on where you get your gratification, and that's you know whether you're a volunteer or something else. That 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 still comes down to internal motivation. Um, so we just have to be open to that. I mean, I think um, I remember which which comment it was shortly above that. Um, Dan's, you know, it means that we don't start dividing people into deniers versus non. Um, but we're not going to be able to reach everyone and everyone's going to agree there's a lot in common with with the COVID vax, but it's still it starts with making the attempt and being willing to to engage. Yeah, I'm just going to pause there because it seems like this there's a lot of active chat and give you guys an opportunity maybe just take a couple minutes if you want to have a quick discussion as a group about this. And, and I would just reiterate that we're really trying to create more of a both and, right? How are we knowing that people are gonna be motivated for different reasons and are coming to it from all levels of motivation, interest and education? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so the, the links that I posted, I mean, there's, there's a ton of research on what motivates people and how people make decisions just in general and a lot that's specific to climate change. So those two links from Columbia University, the Center for Research and Environmental Decision Making and mm -hmm. EcoAmerica have been partnering on really useful guides um, that mostly focus on what motivates people in that particular area and also the, the best way to engage with them. Um, I mean, I, if there's so much out there, it's more just, you know, what's most useful for us and how do we apply it rather than trying to start from scratch on it. Will you post those resources on Basecamp? Uh, I can do that. Thank you. Anybody else want to offer a comment into the room? And um, and again, I will ask you to I'll keep this in mind as when we do look at the draft values and what are those co those common ground values that we can start with. Do I see your name or your hand? Yeah, go ahead, David. No, I'm maybe just taking a step back a little bit here uh, to make sure I understand how the uh, offer of, of this is going to be put out to folks. I mean, out where we are here in Estacada, there's still a significant portion of the community that's not even on the internet, you know. And so, mm -hmm. are you going to reach out, for example, to the Pamplin Media Group to maybe hold a you know, to provide information like an article that, that they could talk about what this is and so that people can read it in, you know, the Sandy paper and the Estacada paper, et cetera, Malala papers, and to get them interested. Otherwise, I don't know how we're going to be able to get this, at least an attempt at a universal, you know, way of reaching out to as many folks as possible to get their uh, interest and, and input. And the second, the last thing I have is, as far as your question regarding how we could help, you know, I think some of us, could would would be and I'd certainly offer to do this could hold the tech, these technical advisory groups for example ours could be the natural and working lands one or whatever and we could reach out to folks out here in the rural community who really have a lot to offer in that regard but know very little about this you know so mm -hmm. that's an idea that I'd certainly be happy to do 
Okay, well, let's add that to uh, the mural board ideas. So we get that that group and that entity established and answering your earlier question. Yes, we've heard this a lot that it can't just be virtual in the way that we are asking people to participate. I will say though that I'm still at a at an we're still at a bit of an impasse in terms of if we can convene people outside of virtual <laughs> engage like bringing people together. And so while we can get creative in spreading the word or not even creative just use the channels that that work like press releases and going through Capital Press or Pamplin Media Group. And um, we've we've heard recommendations. I think Lisa has recommended several times how effective direct mails and postcards have been for to reach some of uh, the groups that she works with. But then once we have them engaged, um, where we will where will we be in January and February in terms of the safety level of bringing people together? So we're still planning primarily for virtual engagement. And this might be a great conversation for the group in the future, if anybody wants to talk to me offline, how to do that in the best way when we are dealing with uh, rural bandwidth issues. Go ahead, Bill. Yes, can you um, step back a little bit on uh, questions on the survey? Yeah. So we submit the survey out to these various groups, rural, um, all the, the groups that you pick. Do we then take their input and revise the entire plan or just parts of it? Or how's that? How's Great that? Possible? So right now, uh, so just to back up again, uh, to, to frame the, the flow of our meetings. And so we, we had been on this two week trajectory and the hope was that um, you all would have this, the, the target outcomes and the high level actions and would be drafting the strategies from there. And really the strategies are what we want to engage the public on, not the target outcomes and the high level actions. We want those to be fairly well established even though they can, they will be reacting and we will be gathering feedback, but the focus is on the strategies. Um, we've flip-flopped our CATF schedule in order to provide more time to develop the low carbon scenario. And so we're talking about engagement today. And then at the next meeting, you're gonna get the, the um, top of the mountain, so to speak, like where are we headed? And, and then come back again to those strategies. And so again, it's the strategies that we're asking for uh, people's reaction and feedback on. Does that help? Okay. Do, do you have any sense as to how large an indoor group is COVID appropriate? And is, and is it based on the size of the facility? How great the um, filtration is? And yeah. People are willing to yeah. wear masks or show vaccination status? Well, I, I think would think masking would be mandatory. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Everyone follows the rules, just saying. Yeah. Well, you don't follow the rules, you don't come in the door, right? I don't know. And I'm, I'm looking at you, Cheryl, um, <laughs> just in case, or even Ellen and Katie, if, if you guys have had conversations about when, when the county might open up doors again. Well, the county is open. So if you do need county services, please go see us in person. Uh, we, we are seeing customers in person. When we talk about gatherings, though, it's a good question. Um, we have not had conversation as a county. Um, as we all know, we still have a mask, statewide mask mandate that is required. It's required in all county buildings for all county events. What we look at going forward of how many people we want in a room and what outreach looks like, I think that's still be, to be determined like everything with COVID. We've been having to move and gauge each time it comes up. 
Um, I do hear the importance of trying to get some people in person and some small groups are able to happen, but it's a lot harder. Um, it's a lot harder to get a large group of people together right now at this point. Yeah. 3,000 people, Jeff. It normally would have been seven, but uh, it, you know, we had to do a lot of work in advance, um, but you, know, you break that down to the smaller segments like the, con the conference room, I mean, the presentation rooms, hotel ballrooms downtown. Um, everyone had to have proof of vax to register. Everyone had to wear masks, um, but it still worked. All right. Well, I'm just going to put a flag in the sand here that this is this will be an ongoing conversation. And like Cheryl said, we're always I mean, we all know that we're dealing with new information all the time and adapting and the we know the ideal and we also don't know exactly what it will look like next week, much less in January. So I would love to leave this as um, um, an ongoing discussion and and also get feedback you know as we start to if if it does if we do have to stay in the virtual realm how we can do that as best as possible okay i want to move on to talk about catf role and i know that we've already had conversations about value so i really want to get us there as well as the audiences so um if we go to slide 25 which is right after the timeline Uh, these are the um, the roles and Katie, can you put it in present? Thank you. Um, so this is you guys know this, right? Like this is what we've been doing as the CATF, generating draft target actions and strategies, integrating community feedback that's coming up. And you're gonna you've got your first piece of feedback today from the YATF and drafting recommendations for the BCC. And if we go to the next slide, these are roles that were pulled out of the charter. So informing colleagues about and community members of the effort and suggesting opportunities for them to engage and provide input and feedback, building trust and strengthening relationships with diverse stakeholders within and across communities and valuing diverse perspectives and approaches. So I'd, I'd love to know from you how you see yourself doing the above in relation to all of those methods that we just chatted about. And if there are other ways that you would like to be involved in making those methods and activities successful. So if you go back over to Slido, I have a little poll and then there's also an option for other. So if there's other ways that you would like to be involved, just add it right into the chat or you can toggle over to the Q&A on Slido and offer how you would like to be involved.
what I've heard from almost all of you. Let me show you what I'm seeing here. You seen the survey? Great. So it sounds like a lot of folks want to forward events from county email and um, share event information via organization's newsletter. So that's something we can absolutely provide. And 71% of you want to participate as CATF liaisons. So to listen and also to speak to your experience and um, participate as co-presenter at engagement events. So there's a distinction there, right? Like it sounds like you want to be there and be present and speak to your experiences, but maybe not be a co-presenter, at least not a large percentage of you. So this is great. And I didn't see any additional ideas come through to the chat. Did I miss anything that someone offered up? I guess I had a clarifying question on the co-presenter. I assumed that meant like, you know, I'm giving permission to the CCC to co-present with the county and not me personally presenting. So could you clarify what that means? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it would be with likely myself and uh, perhaps members of the project management team, but someone who can be a trusted voice and a, okay. someone who is not a representative of the project team, but can help to share information with the public. Okay. I'd be open to doing it now that I know what that means. I didn't want to sign up CCC to do something they may not be open to doing. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, but you threw in the word trust it. And now we're all going to have to withdraw. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'll vet each of you beforehand for sure. <laughs> okay. And now, so staying in Slido, actually guys, um, my other, my other Slido question was uh, just generally, what'd you think of the engagement approach? and something that you would like to see change um, and something you liked. And I'm just gonna leave that. I'm gonna make it live for you. And so you can weigh in. Um, let me just get it up here. It has to go one by one because I want us to move into the audience's presentation and conversation. So feel free to add things up here or you can just um, respond directly in chat. I think we got a lot of good live conversation about what's there, um, but I don't want to miss anything if you want to see anything change or anything that you liked in particular. So for now, uh, let's actually go to uh, slide 28 and then we're going to hop over to Mural pretty quickly. Actually, you know what, Katie, don't worry about, about screen sharing. Why don't you guys just go to your Mural board? So as I have mentioned, uh, we want to try to reach as many uh, constituencies, and you guys have mentioned this too, as possible across the county. And so we want your help in developing a really comprehensive list to draw from. So when you look at the mural board uh, towards the left, the left two thirds of the screen, um, is about audiences and engagement. The left, the table to the far left are those groups that um, will be doing a deeper level of engagement and involvement because they'll be weighing in on um, the strategies related to their content expertise uh, and categorical expertise. So that's the low carbon strategy topics. And then within each table, I'm sorry, and then the table next to it are additional topics. So when we think about um, what are the 
um, oops, Elizabeth is asking that we share the screen so that um, she can also follow along. Katie, are you able to share the mural board? Um, okay, so we've got two tables here, low carbon categories. Those are related to the group, the way that we've already been breaking up our conversations. So this is related to buildings, waste and consumption energy. And then we have additional topics. So what are the additional topics that we know we want to convene people around? And so it could be that they have um, a unique set of expertise based on another type of shared experience that's not necessarily related to technical expertise that's going to come from those, those low carbon strategy topics. And and then we've got a bunch of brainstormed from the uh, project team. So mostly from uh, staff at Clackamas County and folks that have been mentioned to me in various conversations, plus the rural key communicators group, plus uh, business leaders on who should we be engaging um, and at what level. So in both of these tables, they're broken up into two columns. We've got presentations and community-wide discussions. And again, those were around that inform and consult, getting people engaged in the, in the process, but not going deep into the strategies. And then the technical advisory groups and subject matter experts. That's where we're going deeper. So uh, we're gonna quickly break up into the small groups and give you guys a chance to, um, to engage with this. And I, you know, we, we probably have about seven or eight minutes to, um, to have these conversations. My, I'm facilitating and Sarah, Katie and Ellen, Sarah and I, our groups, we're gonna start on the audiences, the additional topics. Katie and Ellen, you guys are gonna start with low carbon strategy categories, just to make sure that we at least get ideas for both of those tables. Okay, so Garrett, I haven't seen your face for a while, but can you give us our breakout rooms? I can do that. All right, I'm gonna open all the rooms, should get an option. Um, everyone who's supposed to record, make sure you hit that record button. Thank you for the reminder. Yep, all right, here we go. Well, was that fast enough for you? Did you, <laughs> I'm not sure it could have been faster. Uh, we came up with a ton of great ideas and there was a question, is this the last time we're gonna look at this? No, so I, the next step here, we'll, we'll, we'll take this and I think put it into a, um, a spreadsheet of sorts and share it back with everybody after we have some time to, to organize it. By the end of my conversation, I was just throwing ideas up there. It wasn't even in a particular bucket. Um, and I wanna give you guys time to check in on the frames and values. So if you have uh, additional ideas that pop into your mind around groups to engage, chat it, add it to Slido, add a note on Basecamp, and then again, you'll see another version of this. Okay, so uh, you can keep Mural open. We're gonna go back into our small groups in a moment. Um, and actually, no, I, I wanna, can you share slides really quick, Katie? I'm gonna talk through these, um, through these frames really quick and give you a little bit of context. Um, sorry, I'm moving quickly to try to uh, get us to three o'clock. So another thing you can do while I am walking through these frames is you can keep your mural open. And if you are having reactions or ideas, changes, suggestions, feel free to pop up a comment on that mural board while I'm talking through each of them. And then we'll have, depending on how much time we have left, we'll see if we can squeeze in another small break, breakout room to um, think through ideas for improvement and any other ideas. Okay, so next slide, Katie. So we have been, We've already talked about the, the reality that we're going to be working and chatting and engaging with 
diverse audiences, diverse views, values, perspectives, ideas about uh, potentially if climate change exists, uh, in addition to how to address it. And like we all have also been discussing, if we just come in with a really strong uh, approach around these are the facts and that's the way this is this is true and there's no other reality we're probably going to lose people pretty quickly and so what are the ways that we can at least start with the intent of identifying where that win-win is uh, where that bridge exists where we can establish some common ground so i'm going to walk through uh, some themes and these were uh, if you go to the next slide, Katie, um, each of these are themes that we heard during the interview phase of the project, which was about a year ago, um, and then a continuation into the focus groups and conversations we had with the rural key communicators. So uh, starting here, and this really underscores this whole approach of identifying and starting with this common ground and wanting people to see themselves in the effort. So the suggestion around emphasizing the outcomes of the cap, and in this quote example, you know, it's, it's the shared benefit of clean air, water, soil, before we get into the content of um, uh, should be healthy soil, Lisa, this is, this is a quote, so I can't correct quotes for grammatical errors. That's what gives them life. <laughs> um, so this means emphasizing the outcomes and what those shared benefits will be before we get to the place of really defining it. So next one. And again, you can offer reactions to the frame on mural. Several interviewees in particular named family and generational heritage and in relationship to land ownership and how land ownership is a family held businesses and gener it, it contains generational wealth and points to generational wealth as really being core values to leverage. So again, tying the, those, the benefits of what a cap could produce a potential outcome uh, to the land and how the cap serves to strengthen and protect the land and then with it family stability and identity. So next, prevention leads to less regulation. So we know that uh, we've, we've had this conversation as well, but that the cap and climate action can trigger fears and concerns around uh, government regulation. And so the suggestion was to kind of call in this tension or leverage that tension and um, play up the opportunity to prevent in order to avoid future regulation. Next slide. Uh, this, this was really strong across a lot of folks that we talked to as well, uh, that people in Clackamas County feel a lot of pride and connection to the land that they are that they are on. And so then that might be different uh, than identifying with the county as a whole. So again, like not that, that um, there might be more with them and or even at that community level, self-interest, community level interest by focusing in on a, on a region, a neighborhood, um, a smaller, geographical focus, and then also people's sense of place and love of the land. Uh, so connections to wilderness, natural spaces, things along those lines. And finally, this one, and um, this, there was not a quote associated directly with this one. Um, and we've talked about it today. So how do we walk the line using language that, that emphasizes investments and that can result in shared benefit and versus costs that can trigger a sense of uh, scarcity or fear or loss or kind of uh, more from like a budget 
perspective. So some of the kind of corollary themes is how upfront investments can link to long-term savings from new technology, how upfront investments can result in new jobs creation um, and or plans and incentive programs related to just transition, um, and anything else that helps to back up the commitment around not leaving anyone behind. Okay, so those are the, the five themes that we heard across our conversations. And so we guys, we have so little time and I really want any reactions that you have at this point to what has been shared. So I would love to just spend even our last two minutes giving some reactions on mural and then we can follow up with this conversation again. And I see two stickies so far. And I see a comment from William, but William, can you add that to the mural board? So we're not breaking into small groups. We're just going to do this solo for a couple minutes. Think about what you've used in your conversations. What has worked? What has not worked? So it's great, you guys. All right, so with one minute remaining, I will say that I will commit to bringing this information back to you and I will leave this mural board open. I'm also always open to um, chats on Basecamp and uh, additional comments as you guys digest some of this information through the climate action email and you can CC me and we will continue to unpack this and get ready for our broader engagement in the early winter. Um, if you have a moment that you want to hang out, I will stay here too and you guys can keep keep adding. And then of course my the question that I always ask, what did you enjoy about this meeting and what would you like to see different for a future meeting so we can plan productive meetings for you all. And other than that, you are free to go. And I appreciate all of your time and expertise and presence per usual. Thanks for being here. So this, this might just be a question for Sarah, uh, either Sarah, I guess. We, uh, several weeks ago, our, our working, our egg, forestry and egg group sent out our kind of our memo where we tried to quantify the uh, carbon storage and sequestration potential on forestry and egg lands. And I'd never heard back if you got that or not. And if so, mainly that was for your consultants so that they saw where the data sources were coming from and so that you could use them to estimate that potential. Is, is that you got that okay? Yep, we got that and we passed it along. I've not fully closed the loop on it, but have, have passed it through its channels. Just make sure, thank you. Yep.
Appreciate it. David, you wrote a book. Well, right? Yeah, but those who, who know me, you, you, I try to be thorough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, stir, no stone left unturned. I like it. <laughs> Anyone who's watched your uh, uh, Clackamas River presentation would also know that. What was that, Adam? Uh, what's what's the name of that series? Oh, the Journey Down to Clackamas. Yeah, it's very detailed for anything just to learn about. Yeah. So much. <laughs> it's always on there. Everything you want to know about the Clackamas in thirty-four webinars. <laughs> thirty-four. <laughs> We're halfway through. <laughs> We're halfway through. <laughs> what a resource. They are great. And Ray, yeah, no resolution. Yeah, Ray, I think it's going to have to, to be determined as we get guidance from county admin. It's not a, um, it's not a decision that um, the department can make leading the project. So we have, to, we have to follow the guidance from a bunch of different people. But yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's important and we'll see what, you know. We'll just wait and see like everything with COVID. I know. <laughs> yeah, maybe the reason why I'm pushing for is because a lot of people talk about rural access and if they can't participate in means because they don't have you know, Wi-Fi access, then that's yeah. a big uh, question mark about do we, do we participate, give everyone equal access. So thank you. Yeah, yeah no. certainly something that we're thinking about. We agree. And I would really welcome cautionary tales, advice, you know, like what's working with other groups that rely on a public engagement. Yeah. Most folks just want to, they want our, our experience in, in planning the meeting, um, which actually included a bunch of climate change sessions, is that people really want to get back together after a year and a half or two mm -hmm. years of Zooming. Um, but they still wanted to feel safe, especially folks who had uh, young kids. Um, so, I mean, we made the decision we were going to exceed what the convention center was requiring at the time, although they kind of caught up to us. We used a third party to upload proof of vax, um, you know, granted it's for a larger group, hmm. um, and still had the mass requirement and uh, did our best to require a negative test as well. Um, although ultimately, the testing shortage made that more difficult, but um, it was also, it was more the people who want to show up and feel comfortable are the ones who show up. And that's probably not the approach that we want, but you can, you can make things safer and you can address most people's concerns, but it's, it, it, it's work on everybody's part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I'll just say, I'll just say yes. <laughs> I really hope that we can do maybe one thing, but we'll see. We'll just have to see. It's, I mean, the, the one thing we, I mean, you can you can spend a while. I mean, masks aren't fun, but uh, folks who are in the convention center wearing masks all day, and it worked fine. You could still hear people speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I'm teaching at Oregon Tech, and no one enjoys teaching two and a half hours wearing a mask, but um, it works. Sometimes you have to ask folks to speak up. Yeah. You mean it's not a free speech issue? No comment. No comment. <laughs> the, the, the piece I was, I was talking about from, from Columbia's Center for Research on Environmental Decision Making, um, I, I will post it in um, Basecamp. It's called uh, The Psychology of Climate Change Communication. And I mean, actually, the, the, it came out several years ago. They've, they've done a couple of different versions and they had uh, uh, companion webinars uh, for Shadow of them. But I mean, these are psychologists who focus on how people make decisions and how to best best appeal that it was really thorough really useful you know kind of you could categorize sort of the different groups on climate change but also some pretty commonly uh effective ways of dealing with people and some of them we're, we're already looking at you know let, let's ease up on the jargon etc but some of them are you know recognize that most people are you know, have sort of that single action bias they're inclined to do one thing so mm -hmm. make it as easy as possible, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, also recognize that people identify themselves in multiple roles and groups. So you have to make sure that you're, you're pitching it towards what they're prioritizing. 
I was looking at an article this morning from Frame, the Frameworks Institute. I'll put that on Basecamp too, just so we all can share resources on um, what did they call it? Kind of like no wrong door with climate change. Like how do you, how do you allow for people to engage from a um, the science of persuasion? But it's yeah, it's all kind of out of the same bucket. It's the same thing we've been doing on emergency preparedness for decades. It's just that um, mostly we've been using really crappy methods that aren't based on any evidence, which is why we haven't moved the needle on preparedness in decades. But that's, I, I have a box of granola bars in my closet downstairs. <laughs> and and you know if I worked for the Red Cross and I I wanted to my goal was to sell kits as a fundraiser, then I'd use the messages we do, but buying a kit isn't gonna do you any good. Oh man. Um, it just, it's kind of, it, it was an ongoing frustration for me, which is why I finally realized, hey, maybe maybe the social science side has something to offer. And yeah. same thing, trying to reach a huge range of audiences, uh, trying to get them to pay attention to something that isn't on their radar, that probably isn't gonna happen tomorrow, but might, um, but that, they can make themselves, they can allow themselves to come out of it better, but also not everyone has the resources to do that. So it's a bunch of different audiences with a bunch of different capabilities. And it mostly comes down to health and social services. And moving away from that old PSA technique of like fear and urgency, but also. You can't really scare people into doing something, but ur urgency is not bad, but you can't keep, you can't keep making it urgent. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when is useless unless you're talking about the difference between five seconds and five minutes. But, you yeah. know, imminence is inevitability and imminence are, are, are different. Hmm. I'm going to I'm going to write that one down as attention. All right. Well, we got, away. yeah, we got some people are still writing down ideas on the, the frames. That's great. Go do some posting. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Ray, it looks like you're looking up at the trees, but I don't think you really are. I have three screens. Oh, mm. Someday I'll have two screens. <laughs> they, uh, they gave me two monitors, but had no camera. And so I used my laptop for the camera mm -hmm. and ordering me a uh, camera so I can put top my monitor. So it looks like I'm looking up all the time. Yeah. But yeah, before COVID, I had no Zoom meetings. And so I didn't have to worry about this. But now yeah. like, oh, well, I guess you're in Zoom meetings all day. So you need to look like you're not looking up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I have my, my larger screen is over here too. So whenever I look at content, I'm looking away from communicating. Yeah. I hope someday we go back to what we had before COVID. I, I looked at my calendar from before COVID. I had no Zoomings at all. I'm like, what happened? Like, why are we doing everything through Zoom now? I, mean, I know why, but it's like, I hope we have some in person in the future because I'm tired of looking at a screen. I know. I'm so tired of it. I got to meet the folks at the county once in the summer when there was like a brief moment of a sense of safety that evaporated as quickly as it came. Yeah. She can validate I have legs. Yeah. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, not, I'm not a mermaid. Used so. to have legs. We don't know if that's still the case. But. <laughs> yes, in July, <laughs> I saw two legs. <laughs> Nice. Cool. Well, I guess I'll be at my next meeting. Another okay. Zoom meeting. Go take yeah. a walk. Yeah, let's take a walk. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ray. Bye-bye.